Okay. All right, good afternoon. We're going to do this one more time. Good afternoon and welcome to Wahoo Public Schools. Um, we appreciate St. Francis joining us uh, today as well as our other patrons that are here. Um, also to all of our uh, people that are joining us online. So welcome to Wahoo Public Schools for our Week of Understanding presentation. I'd like to welcome everybody in attendance and everybody joining us online. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Weiss as our presenter this afternoon as he will be sharing his mother's surviving story about her struggles in the early 1900s in several concentration camps. After his mother's death in 2016, Dr. Weiss researched her journey and now shares her story with schools and groups across Nebraska and beyond. So please help me welcome, in welcome, welcoming Dr. Uh, Stephen Weiss. On. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Or should we turn off the sound? Turn it off. Turn it up? There it is. Hey! Great. All right, thanks for the invitation. Uh, this is a great facility. I'm very impressed. You should be very proud of this. I'd like to tell you a story about my mother. It'll run about 55 minutes, and then I'm uh, going to open it up for questions, comments, get your reactions. Uh, I can stay as long as you want or don't want. <laughs> so the story will be told in three parts. The first uh, part is uh, from her birth in 1924 until life changed at the age of 14, and that's when the Hungarian authorities took over her part of Czechoslovakia. The second part will talk about their forced removal from their home. They were first transported to an uh, open ghetto camp in Mukash, and from there, after about four to five weeks, they were uh, taken to Auschwitz. Uh, the second part will end, we'll be talking about the multiple death marches that she went on from uh, January until late April of 1945. And the third part, we'll talk about a life in America. And so when I tell you this story, please try to envision yourself and your family living under similar circumstances. Michigan, USA. The interview is being conducted in English. My name is Judy Campuser Redden. Would you please state and spell your name? Elizabeth Bodek Wies. The maiden name is Bodek, B O D E K. Last name is W E E S. I was born in Svalova, Czechoslovakia. Could you spell the name of your town? S V A L A V A. So I had a pretty good idea where Czechoslovakia was, but I didn't understand where Svalova was. Here's where we are, in the middle of North America. Here's Europe, and Czechoslovakia is in East Central Europe, a landlocked country, formed after World War II. We'll get into a little more detail uh, geographically. So here's Germany, here's Poland, here's Prague on the very western part of uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, the country of Czechoslovakia, there were three parts to it. You had the Czech Republic with Prague, you had Slovakia in the center, and my mother's area is the very eastern part. 
And uh, it, it goes by the name Subcarpathia Rus. This is now part of Ukraine, and I think everybody knows what's going on in Ukraine now. So uh, at that time, there were three components to Czechoslovakia. There's a little more detailed map, Slovakia here. Svalova, this is her hometown in the Subcarpathia Rus. Mukash or Mukachevo, that's the open ghetto that they were first sent to before Auschwitz. And for those of you who, who's Red Knight? Elie Wiesel's Knight. Yeah, this is where Elie Wiesel's hometown is, city. This is a current aerial view of Svalova. It's nestled in the Carpathian Mountains. She was born September 1st, 1924. April 18, 1944 is when they were forced out of their home and sent to the open ghetto. So the first 14 years of her life was a very good time. Unfortunately, things uh, went downhill. Who is in this picture? My father, Samuel, my mother, Helen, my oldest brother, Adolf, who is 12 years older than myself, my younger brother, who is a year and a half older than I, Louis, I'm on the right, and Olga is the youngest. She's next to my mom. So at that time, families had uh, a number of kids. It was not unusual to have 8, 10, 12, 14 kids in a family. Most of the family perished in the Holocaust. Now, her older brother, Adolf, we'll talk about him some more, he uh, was a student at Prague and got taken to a concentration camp north of Prague called Theresienstadt and was then sent to Auschwitz where he was murdered. Her, mother, her father and her mother, uh, they were uh, murdered upon arrival in Auschwitz. Her younger brother, Lou, was a student in Budapest, and he went underground, so that's how he survived the war. My mother and her sister, Olga, here on the left, they, uh, both, they both survived uh, Auschwitz. The rest of the family perished. So she recounts, until age 14, a very happy life, a very nice community, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, people got along with each other. They did business together, uh, non-Jewish people who are referred to as Gentiles. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that terminology. It's not a derogatory term, but that's how they're referred to. And Jewish people, they did business together. They celebrated holidays together. And uh, it was a peaceful coexistence. Her father was well respected. He was uh, referred to as the Duke, very trusted man. This is a photograph of her home, which is still there. We don't know who lives in it, but this is the home they were forced out of when they were sent to the open ghetto. Her father had a business, the Samuel Bodek store. It was a little variety store where they sold toys and candies and linens and uh, trinkets. This is a photograph of her synagogue, which still stands. It's a bakery now. And this is an older photograph of the synagogue from way back then. And um, the school was very, uh, it was uh, very pleasant in the school. So I, I have good memories from the schools and childhood and all that public schools. The Czechs provided public schools for everybody. I mean, it was uh, not any different than here. That was a, until age 14, and we'll discuss what happened at that time uh, that changed everything. How would you describe the climate between the Jews and non-Jews prior to the war? Very cordial, very cordial. They were not the buddy buddy friends, but it was cordial. People did business together. 
it was, uh, uh, you know, we had um, uh, friends that were Gentile friends. They respected our uh, Judaism. We respected theirs. I had a friend who the father was a, official, a Czech official. I used to go there for Christmas. And uh, I mean, I always played with her, but. They, they, would, they had no problem uh, mutually celebrating each other's holidays. Now, this area of Subcarpathia Rus was uh, different than most of the rest of Europe and uh, Russia, where overt anti Semitism was common and oftentimes violent. For a variety of reasons, this area was somewhat insulated, so overt anti Semitism did not occur very often. In her testimony, she recounted, she recounted a couple episodes where she was playing with friends and referred to as a dirty Jew. There was one potential uh, incident of what uh, a blood libel. I don't know how much you've studied that, but very briefly, that goes back to the year 1100, and it was an old uh, malicious trope where the story goes that Jewish people were killing Christian people, particularly Christian children, to get their blood and to use it for ritual purposes. This type of malicious uh, propaganda often resulted in frank violence. So this almost broke out one time, but didn't uh, fully manifest. Other than that, um, there are not. other than that, there was not much overt anti-Semitism. Again, different than many other parts of Europe. But as the social, economic, and political uh, events changed in Europe, that, uh, that didn't hold together. And uh, it, it, it seemed like uh, all it took is just uh, a spark to bring all the hatreds out. Uh, little uh, review of history, World War I ended in 1918, the world was devastated, not just in terms of the damage from the war, but economically and politically. Things were getting better by the mid-1920s, although by the late 20s, particularly with the stock market crash, Black Tuesday, things uh, went downhill. And as things deteriorated economically and politically, the hatred started to come out and the situation deteriorated. Now, Hitler was uh, legally elected in a democracy, the Weimar Republic. It's hard to believe, but he did win a legal election. And uh, shortly after that, was, uh, he was appointed chancellor, so he was given full authority. And almost immediately, uh, elimination of undesirable people, non-Aryans, uh, began. Mentally handicapped people, political prisoners, Jehovah Witnesses, Roma Sinti, Jews. Uh, this uh, developed quite promptly once Hitler took power. Dachau near Munich was the first concentration camp established, and this uh, was primarily for political prisoners, although it then well, then other, other undesirables were sent there. Uh, over the next several years, from 33 to 38, multiple anti-Jewish laws were passed, basically stripping Jews of their professorships, their legal professions, their businesses. And this culminated in the Nuremberg Laws, the, the, which uh, stated that only Aryans had rights, legal rights. The Munich Agreement, we'll talk about this a little bit more. This is when Czechoslovakia was dismembered, and the part of uh, the eastern part of Czechoslovakia, where my mother lived, was given to Hungarian authority. Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, November 9th and 10th, was when Frank uh, violence broke out throughout Germany. A thousand synagogues torched, 30,000 Jewish men sent to concentration camps. And then September 3rd, 1939, Germany invaded Poland. And over the next few years, as they uh, conquered uh, Poland, the uh, intensification 
of the elimination of Jews uh, developed. Now, almost immediately after Hitler uh, assumed power, spontaneously, and this is, uh, these were just ordinary citizens, throughout Germany, these so sorts of signs uh, appear. Jews not wanted, uh, Jewry is criminal. Uh, this was not prompted by the government. This was the spontaneous occurrence of uh, anti-Jewish hatred. So again, Czechoslovakia in the center. And I want to spend just a moment here to explain the, uh, the Munich Agreement, because this was how Czechoslovakia was taken apart. Great Britain, France, Italy, and Germany, without any input from Czechoslovakia, dismembered it. So this western part, you see Prague here, the Sudetenland and Bohemia, Moravia became incorporated into Third Reich. Slovakia became a puppet state headed by a Roman Catholic priest, Tisa. And this far eastern part, where my mom is from, Munkash is here, Svaloba, right about there. This is the part that was taken over by the Hungarian government. No, the first sign of danger was only when the Hungarians took over, and when, uh, when Chamberlain sold out Czechoslovakia. That's when, the, that's when we started to fear, because you already heard Hitler's speeches on the radio, and you know, we spoke German, and we knew it in the papers, and it started to whip up the hatreds among the people. So. This was in 1938, and 1938, I was not quite 14, and at the age of 14, they finally sold Czechoslovakia, and then they gave it over to a little bit to the Ukrainians who were there for about three or four months, and then Hitler, when he took over the rest of uh, Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia, he gave that part to the Hungarians, so the Hungarians came back, and that's when it really started. That's when it really started. Huh? But it was a downhill thing. I mean, you could already start feeling from the people that lived around you that uh, we were not important enough to be considered as equals, you know, so you, you could feel. Now what she'll describe here, once the Hungarian authorities came in and took over her area where she lived, they started to deport people that were not true Hungarians. So similar to what the Nazis were doing in Germany, non-Aryans, they were gritty. In this part, the Hungarians came in, and particularly people of Polish descent were rounded up, shipped back to Poland, and murdered in the forests there. But they also started out after families that were supposedly not Hungarian citizens, or Czech citizens, supposedly that they were not born in that country, that they came from Poland. And they started to look after people that did not have generations back to show that their grandparents and great-grandparents were born in, in our area or in Hungary. They picked up quite a few people. They picked up one of our very dearest friends, the Sigmunds, the family with the children and everybody, they just took the, this building that you see there, that building belonged to them. And they took them away from their beautiful home with the children and all, and they just took them into trains, cattle trains, and packed them up and sent them without anything out to Poland into the fields. It, it had to be in the 42, 41, 43, I don't remember exactly. It was, it was under the Hungarians already. It was gradual. Things got worse. How were you personally affected when things began to change? 
Well, it, it was, first of all, we were affected because the schooling was curtailed, started to curtail that. Then eventually they started to take away the businesses. And then they started to make curfews. It was a gradual thing. It didn't happen right away. It was like, um, you would think that only this will happen and then a few weeks, few months later, something else came up. So it was a slow stranglehold where you finally, where it finally hit in 44 completely. As I remember, uh, later on, when they, they started to make, a, let us, they made us wear stars, there was a curfew. You, uh, you could only go out till about 6 o'clock in the evening. You know, you couldn't get, uh, there, as far as income, you couldn't get a job. You, could, you, you lived off the few little dollars that you had left from whatever it was. And when you was, it was a stranglehold. They, they just did it like they choked you alive. And, um, and actually, you know, we were teenagers and we, we couldn't, uh, we knew there is a world around us, but somehow or other, we were not in jail, but we, we weren't free either. Or, and the businesses were taken, my dad's business that he worked up from nothing, was taken away, and uh, they uh, they went to Jewish people with the gendarmerie, with the, which is worse than the police, and they would come and just walk in and say, the, "This business is no longer yours." When you say they were the 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 gendarmerie with the, with the uh, what you call the carpetbaggers here. And what they were Hungarians. They came from deep Hungary, they were nobodies, and they came praying, you know, to take over anything that was Jewish, and their eyes saw it, and they wanted it, they were able to get it. They sort of tried to make it look legal, where they would give you for something that was worth a dollar, they would give you a penny, and you had nothing to say about it. So, uh, again, that's her father's store that in a way. Mrs. Weiss, do you remember your father and mother's reaction on the day that you, your father lost his business? He was devastated. He couldn't believe it, that it was happening to him. I mean, he, he, we had pictures of him in the, in the uniform. He, he was four years, you know, uh, uh, in, the, in the army. He, he just, he was a good, solid citizen. He so even though uh, he was a true Hungarian citizen, basically they lost all their legal uh, rights and protection. Now in this uh, particular clip here, Greta is a school uh, friend of hers, uh, and their parents, my mom's parents and Greta's parents were friends in the business together. Uh, are you familiar with uh, the Hitler Youth Hitler Youth was an organization to uh, indoctrinate teenagers into Nazi ideology. Now, my mother will be describing here a transformation in uh, Greta. When the, when the Hungarians came in, naturally the German uh, fifth column started to sort of like uh, wear their uniforms and start marching on the main streets and and all that, and I remember one day being on the street, on the main street, and there comes a, a, a marching uh, band with a bunch of uh, uh, Hitler youth, you know, and they were not the majority, the Schwabs, but they already started to feel their oath. And she is marching, with, and I think, look, and they pass by, and I think, oh, and there goes my friend Greta in a German uniform. I remember I couldn't believe it. Greta, I, the one I went to school with, I studied with, that the mother was a friend of my mother. So this is a good demonstration of the power of 
ideological brainwashing and the danger. Now, in this clip here, my mom is walking down the street, and she bumps into a friend of her mother's. And you remember the, the tall older brother, Adolf? Uh, he had been taken to Theresienstadt. So my, uh, the lady that my mother bumps into is asking, how mom doing? How's uh, Adolf doing? She said, how is your mother? I said, well, my mom isn't very well, I since they took my brother away to Theresienstadt. She says, oh, tell your mom not to worry. She tells me that in German. Tell your mom not to worry. Hitler isn't so bad. All he wants to do is just send the Jews to Madagascar. You know where Madagascar is? That's the island of Africa. He says he just wants to send them there. He's not bad. He's not going to hurt the Jews. So here's Madagascar. Here's where they were in East Central Europe. Uh, they wanted to get, there was a plan to ship 13 million European Jews to this uh, largely inhospitable island where they would have perished. Okay, let's move on. We're going to get into part two here. So they were forced from their home April 18, 1944, uh, repatriated back to Clive, April, end of April, 1945. Uh, what the Hungarian authorities did, there were about 450,000 Jews that they wanted to uh, uh, eliminate from Greater Hungary. And they created six deportation zones. My mother's zone was zone one, about 280,000 people there. Basically, these six deportation zones were cleared, completely cleared. All these people were taken to ghettos, open, closed ghettos, and then ultimately to Auschwitz, where most of them were murdered. So over 400,000 people were just uh, eliminated from the area, and the area became Jew. Of Jews. No, no, I don't believe what they took us. It was uh, April 18th that they took us away, 44, 1944. That's when they took us away from home. No, the night before, they came and they told you, you're allowed one little suitcase and you can just take, that's all. You were not allowed to take anything. But what Dad did, he took, we... So, here's Salaba. Mukash is there. It's about a 25 kilometer uh, ride. They were forced from their home, taken to the synagogue, and then the next day transported to Mukash. And this was an open ghetto, so they had a roof, no walls, and they were there laying on the ground for four to five weeks before transported to Auschwitz. And you could see people, and you know, that because the Jews and Gentiles lived in the same streets, right? they were neighbors, and you could see that they were sort of between the curtains, that you could see some people peeking, and you saw it, that it wasn't from a Jewish home, but they didn't come out to, to say anything. It was just that they walked out. You felt like a criminal that they walked you down. And, and they, they, when they came into the house, they came in, they, we had earrings in our ears that we got when we were born. They were uh, pearl earrings. They took those out. They took everything they could see off you right away. They allowed you to take a suitcase, and they walked you out of there. And I still remember my mom's look when she looked back at the house. Anyway, and, and to the synagogue they took us, and then. Now there had been some rare reports of uh, people that very rarely escaped a, a concentration camp coming there reporting what was going on, but uh, these were rare reports, and they were so ludicrous as to 
when people heard this, they were just thought to be unbelievable. So people thought, well, we're going to be taken to a labor camp, we'll be there, war, and, and then we'll come back home. Not that we knew what was going to happen. So these people really had no idea that they were headed for extermination. This is a map showing uh, a number of the major concentration camps in greater Germany. There were really 42 and a half thousand camps and ghettos throughout Europe, in all different types of camps, uh, slave labor camps, prisoner of war camps, sex brothel camps, camps to euthanize people, uh, to euthanize people that were uh, labeled as not worth, uh, not worthy of living. The Germans really perfected the industrialization of genocide. Now, uh, uh, very briefly, you might, want to, might wonder why Auschwitz became a major extermination center. And very simply, there were uh, dozens of railroad lines that led into Auschwitz, so it provided a very easy way to transport these people to an extermination center. Now, the uh, Auschwitz complex was huge, 15 and a half square miles. And there were three parts to it. This is the actual the town of Auschwitz, but the Auschwitz uh, concentration camp consisted of three parts. Auschwitz I was the prisoner of war camp where uh, Russian and Polish prisoners uh, were taken to. Auschwitz Birkenau, that's Auschwitz II, that's where the Jews were exterminated. And then Auschwitz III. Auschwitz, Monowitz, Buna. This is when El Gerida, Elie Wiesel's night. This is with the area he's talking about. There were 50 uh, sub camps in the Auschwitz complex. These were slave labor camps. This is an aerial view of uh, Auschwitz Birkenau. Again, this is uh, one of the sub camps, Arbitschlager. Lager means uh, camp or warehouse, and Arbit is work. This is one of the uh, subcamps of Auschwitz Birkenau. Uh, I suspect you're familiar with this uh, entrance sign into the concentration camps, Arbach Mark Fry. My mom will describe a little bit more about that in the coming up clip. So, this is the entrance to Auschwitz I. This is the entrance, the rail entrance into Auschwitz Birkenau. The camp had uh, Double barbed wire, electrified set, uh, fences. You can see the brutal winter conditions. And can you tell us the meaning of? I like Mark Fry. That means labor makes you free. So I guess you know people didn't know about the concentration camp. What they did beforehand, that the, the Red Cross. The Swiss Red Cross helped along to send cards, how they got a hold of it, to people that le were left at home, that some people got postcards from Auschwitz, that we are in a labor camp, we are fine, and it came with a Red Cross uh, uh, emblem. So people thought that they are going to a labor camp. It was a farce, but we didn't know it. Uh, the conditions on the tail cars were unbelievably horrible. There were hundreds to 150 people uh, in each sealed cattle car. There was one small window for light and ventilation. T uh, typically, these rides would take three to five days. Uh, my mom didn't remember just how long uh, it took to go from Munkash uh, to Auschwitz. No food, no water. There was a single bucket for uh, uh, using the bathroom. So it wasn't that, wasn't that common for people to die in the transport car. This is a, a schematic aerial view of uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau. This is the train leading in. This white thing here, this is where the separation into two uh, divisions took place, either immediate extermination, gassing, or slave labor. Uh, the gas chambers, crematoria two and three were here, four and five were here. 
This is another view of the train coming at the Auschwitz Birkenau, and again, that white area. This is the area of the separation that took place. You can see the mass of humanity. This is after the cattle cars are opened up, just before separation. You can see mother with a small child. They were being directly sent uh, for gassing. And once the two divisions are more formally completed, now, if you go to Auschwitz-Birkenau and you stand on this area here, this is that white area I was showing you, and that's what transpired at that time, the actual separation. So, immediate gassing or slave labor. You can see here, a mother, grandmother with a small child. You see this line of people, they're being uh, sent to the gas chamber. And. Uh so uh, the dad was taken to one side, the mom and Olga and I to another, and there were some very handsome German officers. Of course, Mengele was there. He was as handsome as you can imagine, and they were polished with all the things. They had some little sticks or something in their head. And I saw him moving people back, and it's not quite clear. Just remember moving mom away to one side, and all got to another, and then he turned to me, and he says, Jung, out or, out or young? That means old or young. And I, 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 I didn't know what was happening. I said to him, young. I don't know. So he sent me to Olga, and Mom, I, I wanted to go with Mom, but the way he separated us, I didn't have a chance to, I, I still feel guilty about saying that I was young. I didn't know why. He just said, out or young. And it was dark, you know, it was nighttime already. So in a heartbeat, she almost went to the gas chamber. Did you ever see either of your parents? No. 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 Not at all. What is the last picture that you have in your mind of your mother? My mother being pushed aside. And my dad sort of got lost between the man trying to get his coat or something. Do you have to call the last words that I'm not excited? Not, not a word. I mean, it, it, it came so fast. I'm not a word. So all of a sudden, they kept walking us somewhere through some, in the dark, I don't know, through fields or through a road. And, it, and, it, and all of a sudden, we saw big fires in the open, and everybody started to scream that they are going to kill us and everything. I remember holding Olga's hand, and she might, and, and everybody was screaming, and we were numb. We were just petrified. We couldn't believe what was happening. They took us to a different uh, uh, camp, I think, and in some kind of a long barrack that had wooden shelves like chickens, you know, that you see uh, when you see a chicken place. And they shot us in so many together, like a herring in there. And after a while, they called us for appel to stand outside. They, there were no names called, nothing. I mean, it became a number suddenly. But it was, it, it, it went so that you couldn't comprehend it even. And then um, they, 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 they made us go, and I remember my while they were giving us the numbers, those uh, people, we asked them, where are our pens? Where are our pens? We asked them, and they were telling us, oh, look at that smoke. And we didn't know what they were talking about. This is what they, you know, they didn't. And then finally one of them said, well, you know, your parents were killed last night. All the older people and all the children. That's when it suddenly, the, the reality, if we, if we, and every day we saw transports of people going in and not coming out. Older people, people with children that were not old, but with children. And all you could see is smoke and fire afterwards, and the smell was just horrible. I, I can't explain you whether, what we felt. It was just being bewildered. I mean, it was, 
if it's just gotten booked. It's like being somewhere where it's not real, like it wasn't real. How anybody was able to survive in the camp is uh, it's just mystifying. Uh, they were poorly clothed. They were starved to death. They had adequate hydration. A pal, I'll show you a photograph of that. They were forced to stand in, in uh, columns at attention so they could be counted. Uh, they were worked to death. Disease was rampant because of uh, lack of sanitation and uh, close quartering. So she read, and this, these are the brick barracks at Auschwitz I, the prisoner of war area, the wooden barracks of Auschwitz Birkenau, and recall in the last uh, clip she was talking about being stuffed in like Harry. The wooden shells where three or four people per shelf were, uh, were forced. This is a photograph of uh, the regime. This is, uh, these are photographs of the children's uh, barracks. This is a photograph showing a Pell, again, uh, standing in columns any time of day or night, any weather condition for hours at a time. Ringo. Now, uh, the gas chamber and the crematoria at Auschwitz one remains intact. The four at Auschwitz Birkenau were destroyed. I'll show you photographs of that. This is the entrance uh, to the gas chamber at Auschwitz one, and then if you're in the gas chamber, uh, that's the inside. So they were uh, forced to take off their clothes, they were shaved, and they thought they were getting a shower, only to be gassed by this cyanide product, uh, Zyklon B. The canisters were dropped in from the roof through these portals. If you're inside, looking up, that's where the uh, our uh, canisters came through. These are the uh, crematoria that remain at Auschwitz I. The Germans, uh, at the end, as they were losing the war, they destroyed the four, four uh, crematoria uh, gas chambers in uh, Auschwitz Birkenau. Here's two and three, and here's four and five. This is a pond where ashes were dumped cemetery for tens of thousands of people. So our Eisenhower's the fronts were closing in, the Russians are coming in from the east, and the uh, Americans, Brit British, are coming in from the west. Uh, when our Eisenhower entered Orndorff, which was a sub-camp of Buchenwald, these are the words he spoke. The things I saw, better description, the visual effort, Evidence and the verbal testimony of starvation, cruelty, and bestiality were so overpowering. I made the visit deliberately in order to be in a position to give first-hand evidence of these things. If ever in the future there develops a tendency to charge these allegations to propaganda. Uh, this is a plaque at the entrance to Auschwitz Birkenau commemorating the over one million people that were uh, murdered. There were uh, 225,000 or so children that were murdered at Auschwitz Birkenau. On January 19, 1945, uh, was the anniversary of when she began her, uh, that was her death march. And each January she would mention uh, this is the anniversary of my death march. And uh, she didn't talk much about her experience. She was basically a closed book. But January 19th, she took Said this. So I grew up thinking, well, you had a bad death march, and then somehow or other you got back to Czechoslovakia and the war was over. Well, that wasn't true, and it wasn't until I listened to her testimony I understood that from January 19th until late April 1945, they were, they were sent throughout Greater Germany, uh, either on open cattle cars or walking on foot through hundreds of miles. And this is the route that the, they were taken. Here is Auschwitz, Birkenau, first along here around Brandenburg, then along Berlin, up to Ravensbrück, then around Frankfurt, and then right to Schoenfeld. It was in this area here when the uh, Germans were disappearing that they were left in no man's land without any, uh, anything. 
to fend for themselves. So basically, for three and a half months, she was in multiple death marches. There were three reasons the Germans put these people on death marches. Number one was to hide the evidence. Number two was to use whatever uh, survivors they could for slave labor. But number three, probably most importantly, was to complete the final uh, solution and exterminate uh, as many Jews as possible. This is a photograph of a typical death march. There's a photograph of an open cattle car that they were uh, sometimes transported on. Uh, one of the death marches she reported uh, being stoned by German youth as uh, <coughs> walking. And at this point, it's a good news, bad news situation. The good news is the Germans have basically lost the war and they're disappearing. And the bad news is that the Russians are coming, and they weren't terribly interested in helping people. Uh, their primary interest, the Russian soldiers, uh, wanted to rape women. Now, how did the mom and Olga survive? They found a uh, Czech family. Uh, the daughters had married Germans. The two daughters, they married German men, and that's why they were able to live in Germany unbothered. And these people were kind enough to hide them in, the, in a bar under hay to keep them away from the Russian soldiers. So, but uh, meanwhile, the Czech. So uh, the, the Czech buses came, took them back to Prague. At that point, my mom weighed 66 pounds. How did she survive? I think the bottom line. Just plain luck or a miracle. All right, part three, let's uh, move on. She came to the United States January, uh, June 24th, 1946. Here's her cruise ship, a merchant marine ship. Uh, this was typical transportation uh, for uh, people coming over. To the This is. Uh, Emma Lazarus's poem at the base of the uh, Statue of Liberty. Let's move to this slide. It's easier to read. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Powerful poem. So here she is, uh, January of 1946. Her nutrition's better, her hair had started to grow in. This is myself in 1946, I think either the end of January or February. It was taken in Bad Mergentheim, Germany. We're looking at here. These are my boots that I came to. Uh, from Prague back to Germany, where Olga got married, and this is the suitcase that brought me from Prague to Germany and to the United States. That was my belonging, or these were my belonging, I should say. So you remember how we started out as pretty well-to-do, comfortable people in terms of physical possessions. This was all that was left. My sister Olga, my brother Lou, and myself at the wedding of Olga's son in Ann Arbor. So these were the three survivors of a very large family. Olga uh, died in her 60s. She developed a very severe lymphoma, which is cancer of the lymph glands. Lou died in his 60s of a heart attack. And ultimately, my mother survived until almost 92. So she was the last survivor of our family. Here's a photograph of my dad. He's a committed bachelor until he met my mom. Here they are on a date on the Coney Island uh, boardwalk along the Atlantic Ocean in New York City. Have you been able to speak about your experiences Else? Not with my children, not with my husband. I have difficulties with it. Why is that, Mrs. Weeks, that you have so 
I get physically and emotionally sick. I try to push it away as much as I can. I know that one should speak and I admire those that can do it. And I feel guilty that I can't be talking about it. Like a lot of my sister was very active in Ann Arbor. She gave lectures at U of M and Eastern and she was speaking about it all the time, but I find myself that I am just devastated when I start out. And my children were asking me, and my niece, my niece and my two nephews, they felt that I'm the only one left in the family that I should, beside their mother, I should speak about it too. So, uh, she's turning 90 years old, and I said, we're going to make you a birthday party, and she got angry at me about that, as she usually got angry for lots of things. And she said, she said, uh, I'm not coming, and I said, that's fine. Rented a hall, invited all the family in, and then she had a good time. You can see her, she's holding court here. All right, let's, uh, let me wrap up. I want to tell you her three messages, and then I'll open it up uh, to your questions, comments. Number one, first message to the last breath, how precious life is. The most important thing to keep the family together whether we have different ideas to accept each other the way they are. And her third message? I just wish there would be a good world for everybody and people shouldn't hate each other. All right. I'm going to open it up to questions, comments, uh, reactions. I can stay here as long as you wish. Uh, thank you so, so much for the kind invitation to be here. Students, if you have questions, you are welcome to come up either aisle and line up behind a microphone, and then at your turn, go ahead and ask. Hi, I, I, I'm, I'm up here. I have a question for you. Okay. Um, through all your mother's ex, uh, experiences, uh, how did that inform like behaviors for you growing up? So, in, in reactions to maybe food or different things growing up, were there interesting things that came about from her experiences in her youth? Uh, yeah, there, there were. I have to add that my dad grew up during the depression, and so. I learned frugality. I learned you don't throw away things. You, uh, you, you, you budget. You, you're careful about uh, what you have, and you're grateful for what you have. That was probably the biggest thing. I learned uh, my my mother grew up. Her family I grew up uh, it was this Eastern European, very paternal centered, autocratic family. So I learned discipline. I learned hard work for both of them. Yes? Why did they send them to the camps and so The question is why did they send them to the camps instead of killing them instantly? Well, we didn't get into this, but as uh, as you remember I explained to you that Germany invaded Poland. And as they invaded Poland and moved into Russia, they had what were called Einzengruppen. These were killing squads. And they were using either gas from uh, vehicles.
just siphoned in and killed people from carbon monoxide or bullets. And they found it was very inefficient. And they would also, they found it very wasteful using the bullets for that. So they had to devise a higher level of, uh, of uh, extermination. That's really what, what the concentration camps uh, function is. At least the extermination camps. Keep in mind there were lots of concentration camps, not all extermination camps. A lot of them siphoned people to the extermination camps. Thank you. Excellent. Well, my mom, did everybody hear that how did my mom escape? She didn't escape, she was marched out on January 19, 1945, because the Russians were rapidly, they were there a few days later, so the Germans wanted to evacuate the camp. So, no, she didn't, very few people escaped. is after coming to America was my mother a practicing Jew. Uh, my mother never denied her Judaism. There were a lot of uh, survivors that rejected Judaism. Uh, she never did that, but she certainly wondered where was God? God was able. And uh, my dad was Orthodox. Uh, and Judaism, Orthodox means uh, the branch that uh, observes all rules and regulations. So she went along with my dad and, uh, and adapted to, to that lifestyle. But she, yeah, she was always a proud Jew. Um, did she ever tell you anything about her experience? The question is, did she ever tell us anything about her experiences? Very little. She was a closed book. People didn't talk about the Holocaust until about the 1970s, early 1980s. That's when people started, research was done, archives were open. People started to talk about it. And this is why it's so important now to discuss it so we can see the evil that can occur in the world so that we do speak up when this happens. But she would only talk about bits and pieces. January 19th, she would usually mention, this is the anniversary of my death march. Um, later in the years, thank, thankfully she could send it to do this. This is a one of the Shoah testimonies from Steven Spielberg on the USC. It's, it's, it's accessible. There's 55,000 testimonies. Uh, she agreed to do this. And years later, we were trying to put together the family genealogy, and she found it very hard to talk then. Uh, so uh, thank God she left us with this story. How old was she when we got when she got to America? Uh, she got to how old was my mom when she got to America? 1946. So she was 22 years old. And the uh, first thing she did when she got to America, she kneeled on the ground, kissed the ground, and the next thing she did, she went out and got a job. She didn't want to be a uh, a burden on anybody. All she wanted was freedom. Yes, sir. Was there ever a funeral for the mother and father and her brother that she lost? Was there ever a funeral for the mother and father? No, these, these people were uh, gassed and then put into the ovens, burned to ashes, and then the ashes were put in the pond I show you, or used for uh, the, Germans were very efficient recyclers. They had other use for ashes. So the answer is no. How long was the entire thing happening? Excuse me? How long was the entire thing happening like how the long, camp? How long was she in the camp? Yeah. At Auschwitz? 
Yeah. How long was she in Auschwitz? She was first at, at the uh, Munkash camp. That was for four or five weeks. Then she was transported to Auschwitz. She arrived there on May 21st, 1944, and then it was forced out on the death march January 19th. So that's probably another reason she survived. She wasn't there that long. Is there anything I wish people could do differently to prevent things like this? Well, unfortunately, we have genocide throughout the world now. And that's one of the reasons I, I talk. We have to learn these lessons. We can't just eliminate people that are others that we don't want for whatever reason. We have to talk about it. indifference. We can't be indifferent. We can't be a bystander. We have to be an upstander. And unfortunately, the behaviors that led to this mass murder, they're still occurring today and throughout the world. And uh, that's a big reason I'm out here uh, talking. We didn't need a generation. We have to teach you this. And you guys have to be aware of it. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Speak out. Do you ever wish that your mother moved to America before the, uh, before the Holocaust? Do I ever wish my mother moved to America before the Holocaust? Certainly. I've often wondered, a number of families left, uh, particularly in Germany. Uh, once Hitler took power, a number of the Jewish families, they took off. As time went on, it became harder and harder to and so it basically the gates were closing. So if you got out early, you were in good shape. But the, the longer you stayed, the more impossible it was to get out. Did you ever learn German? Did I ever, ever learn German? No. Um, on that last slide, one of the things uh, I was saying, how did my mom survive? Being multilingual was a great survivor skill. It, uh, they spoke mainly Hungarian in their home, Yiddish, which is a, a, a kind of a, an amalgamation of German and Hebrew. That was their second language. She said they spoke German, so they understood what Hitler was uh, preaching. They knew a little Ukrainian, a little Russian. So it, Europeans are multilingual. Americans, for the most part, it's English. That's all they know. Do you know if your mom ever saw any German soldiers feeling bad about what they were doing? Do I know if my mom ever saw any German soldiers feeling bad about anything? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I've not been asked that before. Let me think for it. <laughs> there, uh, I didn't show you this. This uh, part of her testimony. Um, Olga was uh, Mengele, Dr. Mengele, if you bring me the slide, he experimented, medical experiments on these inmates. And he operated on one of Olga's breasts. And she got an infection. And my mother was trying to smuggle medical supplies, whatever she could get her hands on try and help Olga. There was an incident where she's walking, she, uh, she's walking and she has some stuff in her hand. She didn't know if it was helpful or anything. They wrapped in paper. She, and she's debating. She says, uh, she's approaching a German Nazi uh, SS officer and at a checkpoint. And she's debating. What do I do? If I hide it and they search me, they'll kill me instantly. She decided she'd keep it in her open hand, wrapped in here. She approaches him and says, 
And he says to her, what's in your hand? And she looked him in the face and said, bread. And he says, oh, okay, go. And so that was maybe the kindest thing she got out of a German soldier. He could have forced it, he would have shot her right out of the spot. Uh, How long did my mom and all the hide from Russians till they were out of the camp? Uh, I think it was about two to three weeks. They were left in no man's land. Nothing. Germans disappeared. They're on their own. She met my father here in America. My, my dad was uh, American dealer. And uh, she met him here. Yes, sir. Do you know what your uncle was doing when he was hiding? Yes, I do. Do I know what uh, my uncle was doing? Uncle Lou, who was at, at, at studying in Budapest. Yes, I do know what he was doing when he was hiding. He went underground with the, uh, 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 Jew, the Jews in Hungary that were that going, well, we have to do something to fight the Nazis. Eventually, he became an interpreter in the Russian army. And he rose to the level of a captain. And that's what he did until the war ended. Once the war ended, he went into, a, uh, he went into the forest. He took off his Russian uniform, put on civilian clothes, and, and moved on. So then another example of how important it was to be multilingual. Did you ever meet your aunt Olga? Did I ever meet my aunt Olga and my uncle Lou? Yes. Yeah, I grew up with them. I, uh, I didn't have any grandparents to speak of. Uh, but yeah, they, they, we, we, we all lived in the Detroit area. And the, uh, family was very, very important. What did my aunt and uncle and mom do after the Holocaust? I mentioned my mom, she, she went right away. Uh, she, she was a good seamstress. She learned math in her home. So she went, and she got, as soon as she got here, she got a job in the pie factory making pies. Uh, I don't remember, Olga, Olga married an American GI. And so she didn't necessarily have to work. But the GI was from Detroit. So Olga and her husband, they pretty much went to Detroit right away. I think Lou and his wife were in New York for a bit, but Detroit was booming. It was one of the great cities of the world. It was booming. And the, uh, the word was move to Detroit. There's great business out there. So Lou and his wife moved to Detroit. Mickey had been, Olga's husband, Mickey, had been from Detroit. They were there. And after a few months, they told my mom and dad, you know what? There's great opportunity there. So uh, my mom and dad went there. What Lou did is he started a drapery and linen store. And then my mom uh, went into the same business. Mm -hmm. Do I know anything about my grandparents? Uh, I know what, what I've told you now about my mother's parents, okay, so I never met them, they, they, uh, they were murdered. My, I never met my dad's father, he, he died, uh, uh, he died, uh, I think, in the 50s, of stomach cancer, so I, 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 I was a little boy then, I never met him. My, uh, Dad's mother, she went, she died in childbirth. She was like 22 years old, died in childbirth, so I never really met them. Do you teach your kids about this? Do I teach? 
my kids about this. I try to. I try to. Uh, um, it's, it's, I think it's painful for them to, to listen to this. I try to. <laughs> Since my mom really didn't touch on the story of the Holocaust in my aunt, uh, Olga did. Olga was, she was an open. She was out in the community, again, living in Detroit, and Harvard's not too far from there. She was publicly talking. Lou did, Lou, Lou, Lou was a businessman. He was more interested in doing business activity. Uh, but he had a different experience because he had been underground and with the Russian army, so it was a completely different uh, experience. How did this uh, affect you growing up? How did it affect me growing up? Uh, or like after you found out? Well, it was mysterious. My mom had that tattoo on her forearm. I didn't really understand that. In uh, the Detroit area, the Detroit community, Jewish community center in Detroit, there were a lot of survivors and they all had tattoos. And none of them talked. And a lot of these survivors, like the soul had been sucked out of them. They were like zombies. And they were frightening. It was a, you see a horror movie, you see a zombie. That's literally what these people were like. It was, as a kid, it was frightening. They didn't know what, what was going on. Couldn't understand it. I think it's better now what we do now, we talk about it. We talk about it. So you, it, it, it's painful to talk about it and listen to it, but once you understand it, the, the mystery that goes away. Did your mom ever get like emotional out of nowhere? Did my mom ever get emotional out of nowhere? Uh, yeah. And that was another thing. Sometimes she would just fall apart and we didn't know why. Uh, if there is one word to describe your mom, what would it be? If there is one word to describe my mom, what would it be? Um, kind. She, as bad as things might have been for her, or so, if she saw somebody that was Unfortunate, she lend a hand. Why did the Germans and um, Hungarians go after Jews personally? Why did the Hungarians and Germans go after Jews? Well, that's a 2,000 year history issue. <laughs> you got 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I got 15 minutes. Uh, It's the world's oldest hatred. It's the world's oldest hatred. I think there's an excellent book by that title. Uh, who knows uh, why Jews are singled out? Jews are 0.2 percent of the world's population. There's eight and a half billion people in the world, and uh, I think there's. Maybe 20 million Jews, 0.2% of the world, and yet there's blame and anti Semitism. Jews are blamed for this, they were blamed for COVID, they were blamed for put, make, make, making people put masks on. Hatred is impossible to understand. You can't rationalize it, you can't understand it. But you have to recognize it so you know how to deal with it. Has your mom ever tried making emotional uh, emotional relationships with people in the camps? Has my mom ever tried making emotional relationships with people in the camps? There were several uh, women from Svalbard, her hometown, that were in Auschwitz with her, and they also survived. Amazingly, Several of them wound up in the Detroit area as well. So they kind of had, they, never, they really didn't talk together about it, but they had that emotional support of being together. Can I ask you about the Holocaust and the angel of death card? Was he mentioned anymore? 
was he mentioned? Like, uh, the Yes. I didn't play a lot of that clip. Joseph Mengele was the angel of death. He was the one that uh, the trains came, the doors were unlocked, and the separation took place. He was the one that sent people immediately to the gas and those to be slave labor. He also he was the one who uh, decided who he would do medical experiments on. What has inspired you to talk about your mom's history? What has inspired me to talk about my mom's history? Uh, the world in its current state. Uh, again, hatred everywhere, bigotry everywhere, uh, genocides everywhere. Uh, I want the young generation to know and uh, to be aware of this. Did your mom have any friends that survived? Yeah, I, uh, did my mom have any friends that survived? I mentioned just a couple minutes ago that there were a few friends from her hometown that were in Auschwitz that did survive and uh, were in the Detroit area. Are any of them still living? They've all, they've all passed away. Did your aunt and uncle used to tell you stories about it? Did my aunt and uncle used to tell you stories about the Holocaust? Uh, no, my aunt and uncle really didn't tell us stories about the Holocaust. Uh, uh, Olga gave talks in public, but again, when the, when the three of them were together, they didn't want to talk about this. How did both your parents die? How did both your parents die? How did both my parents die? Uh, well, my dad uh, was a heavy smoker, three packs a day. My dad didn't like doctors for a variety of reasons, even though I became a doctor. And uh, he only got medical care at the end when he was really sick. So eventually, all the smoke bad habits, lack of medical care caught up to him. Uh, my mom, she was almost 92, and it was, uh, the body was withering away. The other problem my mom had in her later years, she was losing her hearings rather significantly. And part of that was related to uh, on those death marches, they would stop at train stations and the allies were bombing the train stations and the bombs going off all this ultimately led to loss of hearing but eventually she just her body gave out her mind didn't she she was perfectly intact mentally kind of like a Hollywood movie. They had made a pact that if things really deteriorate and we're all separated and we survive, we're going to meet at a certain address in Prague. And they remembered that. So my mom and Olga were together, but Lou was there. He remembered the address, and that's how they, it sounds kind of corny, but that's Let me uh, go over here. Did my mom have any triggers to wild sounds? Did my mom have any triggers to wild sounds? Yeah, it went, and as her hearing deteriorated, um, she, couldn't, she couldn't go to uh, music, the symphonies, the movies, because the reverberation you know, was just very uncomfortable. If your mom were still alive, alive today, how do you think she'd react to racism? Oh, if my mom were still alive today, how do I think she'd react to racism? She'd call it out. She'd say, here, I'll show you what hatred and racism do. See, uh, the Jews were felt to be a race. And the 
not an ideology was to eliminate the Jewish race. So she called it out. Did the relatives want to get their tattoos removed? Uh, Olga never did. I, uh, my sister and I, we really pushed my mom to remove the tattoo. And we said, you're not a prisoner anymore. You're not a kid, piece of cattle. You want to get her lost, get it off. And she did. She took it off. What was the first reaction? Uh, when I found out this happened to my family, probably stunned. Did your mom ever try to escape the whole, like the consciousness? Did my mom ever try to escape Auschwitz? Virtually no. No, it was virtually impossible to. All right, great questions. Thank you. You were very attentive. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today. Those are people that were able to come and those people that are online. Um, let's give Dr. Weiss another round of applause.